it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, when Clay called me and said um, if I was interested in presenting and talking about Puerto Rico, now that it's so relevant after uh, the president um, made it very clear that there's an ocean between the United States and Puerto Rico, we thought it was um, ac absolutely critical that we talk about this really important issue because, to be quite frank, a lot of people don't know about Puerto Rico. I mean, um, I was born and I lived there for over 18 years, but my dad was in the military, so I, you know, I traveled a lot and I lived in North Carolina. My childhood was in North Carolina and I don't remember learning anything about uh, Puerto Rico in, in the history classes or civics classes. I don't know about you guys, but um, it's really an important issue. It's an issue that I became very passionate about after uh, my dad retired and we moved from Puerto Rico to the United States. And then I started to realize when I was there how we couldn't vote for president. And I remember telling my dad, I'm like, Dad, you served in the military for like 24 years and you can't vote for the commander in chief? What's up with that? And, you know, he was, he would start stuttering as most people do and they don't know, they don't know how to explain it. So then I became very uh, passionate about this issue, um, borderline obsessive, because I think it's a really important issue that needs to be attended. So as uh, Sharon mentioned, one of the topics of the sustainable goals of the United Nations is reducing inequality in countries. And um, in the country that we live in, um, although we do have uh, uh, a good democratic system, although that's been up for debate uh, with the whole electoral college and everything, um, but um, Puerto Rico, uh, the people can't vote. There's 3.5 million American citizens there more population than 22 states uh, they can't vote they don't have representation and we have to if we're going to reduce inequalities worldwide we have to start here and if we as a nation are going to preach about freedom and democracy worldwide we need to practice what we preach am i right all right so we're at number 10 reduced reducing inequalities so as president trump eloquently explained to us there's an ocean between the US and Puerto Rico. We're in the Caribbean, right next to the Dominican Republic. And I'm gonna give you a little backdrop about the history of Puerto Rico, but I'm, I'm gonna try really hard not to bore you. The history of the US-Puerto Rico relationship is quite complicated. In 1898, US forces, the military, invaded Puerto Rico, took over it. It was in power of Spain. Uh, in 1902, the US declared Puerto Rico a territory and in 1917, Puerto Ricans were granted uh, U.S. citizenship under the Jones Act, which I'm pretty sure you guys have heard recently in the news. Um, the Jones Act gave Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship uh, mostly because uh, they wanted to recruit Puerto Ricans to fight in our wars. After that, from 197, excuse me, from 1902 to 1946, all governors on the island were appointed by the federal government. They weren't elected. Sounds like uh, Great Britain, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, they were all appointed. I think there was over like 30 governors who were appointed directly by the President of the United States. But then around 1946, something started happening around the world. Can anybody tell me? War, Cold War, right? The U.S. was getting bashed a lot internationally. And one of the talking points that the United States enemies abroad would use against the United States was, why are you attacking us? Look how you treat your own people, the African-Americans. Look how you treat Puerto Rico. I mean, um, they're not even citizens. So then the US rapidly let the people, they appointed a Puerto Rican gover governor. It wasn't elected, he was appointed, which was Jesus Tepinero in 1946. Then in 1948, the first Puerto Rican governor was, was elected, Luis Muñoz Marin. And then in 1952, Puerto Ricans became a self-governing commonwealth. Now, what's a self-governing commonwealth? Again, the international community was calling us out for many years because we were holding, in effect, a colony in Puerto Rico of citizens who can't vote and participate in the electoral process. So they created a, a, status, uh, a status on the island where they were allegedly self-governing. And that's um, how the current status that Puerto Rico has, which is called a free associated state, which is, it's very hard to explain, but it's not free. It's under the rule of the US. 
it's associated to the U.S. and it's not a state. 2003, the U.S. Navy base closed their bombing range on Vieques, as you know as well, probably. Uh, there was a lot of uh, controversy over this. The U.S. Navy would bomb one of the islands in Puerto Rico for like 50 years. It was a practice range. Uh, people developed cancer and whatnot. Uh, so they closed that in 2003 after mass protests. In 2012 was a turning point. For the first time in Puerto Rico's history, over 54% of the people of Puerto Rico voted that they wanted to get rid of the political relationship that they have with the United States now. An overwhelming majority of them voted for Puerto Rico to become the 51st state. Unfortunately, U.S. Congress has jurisdiction over Puerto Rico uh, under the Territorial Clause of the U.S. Constitution, which states very specifically that they have plenary powers over Puerto Rico. To this very day, we're still waiting for Congress to act. Then in 2017, this year, like three months ago, there was another vote, and 97% voted for statehood. Congress has yet to do anything. And this is while we're internationally talking about democracy. Uh, in 2017, the U.S. territory declares bankruptcy, and then, as you all know, Hurricane Maria hits it, which was devastating. It's the most devastating hurricane in the history of Puerto Rico category four and the damage is insurmountable this is one of the toughest times in puerto rico's history imagine you getting knocked down on the floor and somebody coming and kicking you that's basically what what's what's happening in puerto rico i'm going to stop talking for a bit i'm going to ask everybody in the crowd does anybody know what colonialism is has anybody seen the series john adams i love that series and it specifies exactly one of the scenes that you talk about about um a group of citizens colonial community who were unable to have a say under the British monarchy and they would impose taxes and they didn't have a say which is very similar with with Puerto Rico Puerto Ricans have one member of Congress who can speak on the floor of the house but he can't she, she or she can't vote they can vote in committee but get this if the vote is a deciding vote in committee it doesn't count that's Puerto Rico situation. So this is like the most um, general uh, definition I was able to find of colonialism. A country or area under the full or partial political control of another country, typically a distant one and occupied by settlers from that country. So as I mentioned before, Puerto Ricans can't vote for President of the United States. And uh, this was actually deemed through a series of uh, US Supreme Court cases called the Insular Cases. I invite you to, to look it up uh, where Basically, they describe Puerto Ricans as savages that were never accustomed to the American way of life. And this law still stands. This is still good law. And actually, in 2015, a good friend of mine, an attorney in Puerto Rico, uh, he filed a lawsuit against the federal government demanding the, the right to vote. He lost four times. And each and every time, this, the, the U.S. Court of Appeals used these cases to justify it. As I mentioned, they don't have uh, equal representation. They have a non-voting delegate. And uh, as I mentioned in committees, if it's a deciding vote, it, the vote doesn't count. Also on the other side of the coin, you know, this debate is between statehood, people who support statehood, and, uh, and people who support independence. Um, and under the United, Na under the United Nations Charter, uh, sovereignty as an independent country is a fundamental right. It's an inherent right. There's over 185 free countries in the world, and there's around 16 colonies. Uh, Puerto Rico was taken off that list in 1952 uh, because of the increased tensions uh, over the Cold War. But for every effect, Puerto Rico to this very day is considered a colony um, because of the lack of self-government that they, that they have. Puerto Rico also has the highest poverty rate in the United States. 46% of the people there live below the poverty rate. 11% unemployment, and it's, it's two times more poor than this, the poorest uh, state in the United States, which is Mississippi. Now, these are a lot of facts that I know that you probably haven't, you never heard of, and later during the presentation, I'm going to explain why. This is a good friend of mine. His name is um, Nelson Dennis. He uh, published a book called War Against All Puerto Ricans, which I recommend that you go pick it up. It's a number one bestseller on, on Amazon. And he's talking, he's gonna explain here really briefly, I think it's the best guy to like explain what the Jones Act is. I know it's been on the news recently. 
The Jones Act, in essence, is basically no international ships can come into Puerto Rico without U.S. authorization. For example, if, you, if you're Walmart or if you're a big, you have a company and you want to receive goods from a supplier from Canada, that supplier has to send the goods to Jacksonville. They dismount the cargo, put it on a U.S. ship with U.S. crew, and then ship it to Puerto Rico, not directly to Puerto Rico. What does that cause? Increased prices. And I already mentioned, is one of the poorest jurisdictions in the United States, you're gonna increase prices, so it doesn't make sense, right? I mean, you have the poorest juris American jurisdiction, and at the same time, cars there are $6,000 more expensive than here. And he's gonna explain why. To this very day, that's the best guy. That he, under two minutes, he explains it the best. Um, so there's clearly an inequality there in terms of commercial you know, trade and uh, the economic situation in, in Puerto Rico. Basically, you know, after years of studying this and researching, the bottom line is Puerto Rico is a tax haven for U.S. corporations. And I know that's something that all of you may have never heard of, because we like to talk a lot about Cayman Islands, other exotic islands, but a lot of us don't know that we have a tax haven in our own backyard. And the reason you never hear about it is because both parties uh, receive money from those corporations. As I mentioned earlier, um, there's uh, 195 sovereign countries in the world. 16 are non-self-governing uh, countries. I've had the opportunity to testify um, in favor of the decolonization of Puerto Rico on three occasions. This is the list of people, uh, of countries that were taking off the list. If you can, as you can see over here, uh, right here, Puerto Rico became a commonwealth. So it was removed from the UN during the Cold War. Again, uh, a lot of people question why Puerto Rico was mysteriously moved from the list of colonies during the, the, the era of the Cold War. And it was because, quite frankly, because of a lot of international pressure against the United States in terms of you're maintaining a colony. So our government said, well, we're, they're not really a colony because, you know, they, they govern themselves. They can, go, they can vote for their own governor, but they can't vote for their president. And this is one of the big issues for my girlfriend. But for those of you who don't know me, my girlfriend is uh, Josephine Balzac. She's part of the, the executive board of Ideas for Us. And this is her big issue, uh, the environment. And I've learned so much uh, with her because I was more of like a civil rights, uh, you know, Puerto Rico political status type of guy. And then um, she told me, like, do you have any like heavyweight leaders of the U.S. who have ever talked about, you know, the environment in Puerto Rico? And I said, I remember uh, an old video, this video, which is like from, I think 2001, President Bill Clinton talking about how Puerto Rico can be the mecca of renewable energy. Because if you come to think about it, we're an island. We have wind, sun, hydro, and just this video fascinates me because he looks so, like, so excited. He looks like a little kid, you know, excited with a new toy. And um, if we can just go ahead and play it. I I'm always a firm believer that when something bad happens, it's for a reason. And I know, you know, that we hate to hear that, right? Like if we have a breakup, oh, it's for a reason, you know, it's, it's, for, it's for the best. But in Puerto Rico, I really believe this is true, even though we're going through this devastation. Because Puerto Rico, as President Clinton mentioned, has relied on importing 100% of their energy, which is basically causing them to be strangulated economically. Now, with the pass of the hurricane, their entire old electric grid has been wiped out which is th that electric old grid depended 100% on fossil fuels. Now we have the opportunity, the golden opportunity, to attempt to do what President Clinton's vision um, was in Puerto Rico, which is to make it fully uh, sustainable using renewable uh, sources of energy. So after Puerto Rico's statehood vote was ignored, uh, even though we thought that a 97% was gonna be very, very uh, convincing, uh, Congress went ahead and passed a law called PROMESA. What's PROMESA? It basically uh, appointed a board of six unelected people who were going to make decisions on the island without the people's say uh, in order to force the island to pay a $70 billion debt, which was triggered and created by Wall Street. Um, it also, th there's provisions of the PROMESA law that bars public hearings on environmental issues. Uh, the EPA rarely enforces law in Puerto Rico, as Nelson Dennis in the prior video said, what happens in Puerto Rico usually stays in Puerto Rico. You never hear of, of the injustices there. Toxic, toxic landfills there, coal ash dumping, 
are the order of the day. There was a recent months, there's been huge protests. And this is the result of uh, Hurricane Maria on the few sources of renewable energy. We had some windmills over here destroyed. And this is, this is actually, you may not be able to see it from here, but it's a solar panel farm, totally decimated. And that's my daughter. That's us at the, the windmill farm in, in, in Puerto Rico, in Santa Isabel. Most of those windmills you see there, unfortunately, were destroyed by, by the hurricane. So I know that the previous hive they were talking about, or I think it was another meeting of ideas, they were talking about possibly looking into um, new designs for, for these sources of renewable energy to you know, withstand the impact of hurricanes. Because you know, this is a good step in the right direction. It was destroyed by hurricanes. And last but not least, corporate exploitation. I think the three pillars of Puerto Rico's problems can be divided in number one, corporate exploitation, number two, colonialism, and number three, environmental injustice. And I believe that this is the root of Puerto Rico's problems, and believe it or not, it affects each and every one of the people here in this room today, and all Americans. Prepare to be outraged. So just as a uh, brief backdrop. The corporate tax rate in the United States is 40%, give or take, 35, 40%. Basically, if you're a business owner, let's say if you have your own business, you generate a million dollars a year, just for an example, uh, you have to pay 40% of corporate taxes to Uncle Sam, right? That's a big chunk. In Puerto Rico, if you set up your business in Puerto Rico, your plant in Puerto Rico, 0%. So in the United States, if you set up your shop in the continental United States, you have to pay 40% corporate taxes. In Puerto Rico, if you set it up, it's zero. You do have to pay a local Puerto Rico tax, which is only 40%, I mean 4%. If you compare 4% to 40, that's it's still a good deal, right? So that's why you see a lot of millionaires and billionaires going to Puerto Rico, even though it's getting messed up. You're like, why are they going there if it's the island's all wrecked and they're going there because of this? So basically, Puerto Rico is a US domestic tax haven. As I mentioned before, you know, the average, uh, it's the average federal corporate tax in the U.S. is 40%, and there's a state corporate tax, which is around 11, so it's around 60%. In Puerto Rico, you paid four. So it's good, bus it's good business to, to set up shop in, in, in Puerto Rico. And some of the companies who do it, believe it or not, is Microsoft. Microsoft is the number one donor of the Democratic Party, and Pfizer is the number one donor of the Republican Party. Guess what? They're both in Puerto Rico. So this is the example I just showed, million dollars. You do the math. So in 2011, there was a congressional investigation where they brought a spokesperson from Microsoft to talk, and he was sweating buckets um, because the media was there, and um, he had to admit on the record, and he did, that Puerto Rico was a tax haven, and they were evading $4.2 billion of taxes a year when you and I pay taxes, right, every year. They go down to Puerto Rico with some pina coladas, and 4.2 billion dollars they save. And it's not only these two companies, hundreds of US companies do it. So that's why we never hear about it. Because it's, uh, I like to call it a, a dirty little secret. I looked up Microsoft Corporation's donations to Congress. You can see it right here, $8 million. And if you click on the link, both parties. But this is a good example of inequality, right? Um, she mentioned earlier that inequality can be seen through uh, racial discrimination. It can be seen through inequality of, you know, of, of pay. And uh, that's the case in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is 100% Latino, obviously. 46% um, are, are poor. They don't have a say in Congress. They don't have access to the U.S. media. So they've been exploited for over a century for corporate interests. You know, um, but I, you know, all, although all of this sounds negative, um, I'm gonna tell you a little story. I worked in Congress in 2004, and then in the White House in 2012 for a brief period um, with a goofball called Joe Biden. Um, <laughs> he's like a 14-year-old trapped in a 70-year-old body. But um, I remember when I was 22 and I interned in 2004, I was like all excited and all like hyper, yeah gonna save the world we're gonna decolonize Puerto Rico and one of the staffers there who's been for like 30 years he said settle down settle down settle down you're in DC okay and this is like running on a treadmill 
no matter how hard you run, you're going to stay in the same spot. And that always stuck with me because it like, kind of like, damn, you know, that's messed up. You know, he just brought me down like that. But I never gave up. I just kept at it, kept at it. And we can get things done, you know. I, I have hope that we can. You know, we've demonstrated throughout history that when we come together, we can do great things. And I think that it's important. That's why I, I happily accept it because, you know, I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> I'm 35. Uh, back then I was like 21. And I think that the most I can do now is just plant the seed, you know? Like spread the word, create awareness, and it's up to all of you to, to spread the word about Puerto Rico because a lot of people for decades have thought Puerto Rico is like, oh, it's a little island, it doesn't affect us. I just showed you those $4.2 billion that Microsoft dodges, guess where that's supposed to be? In the U.S. Treasury for better schools, for better roads, for, for, you know, for better infrastructure. And these people are pocketing it. You know, so I, I invite you to, to keep creating awareness and uh, be the voice of change. You know, we can do it.